Uh, yes, it's a pleasure for me to be today at Chatla and uh, to be able to present the research I've been doing uh, at the GIGA um, in the last years. And it's a pleasure for me as well to have Javier, a specialist, very famous specialist on this topic as my discussant. So thank you, thank you very much. Um, well, I'm gonna talk about presidential term limit reforms in two regions of the world. And this is a comparison uh, that I have been doing uh, with Charlotte Heil, a colleague of mine in, at the GIGA Institute of African Affairs. Uh, she's the one who should be getting all the questions on Africa, but I do my best. <laughs> And uh, we are, this is still a um, work in progress. So I very welcome all your comments um, and additions to our research. Um, the project um, is founded by the German Research Foundation. And it's an example, I think, of the way we develop uh, research uh, at the GIGA, where we normally meet uh, people working on the same topics, and, uh, but in different regions. And that's why, why, how I became aware that the same kind of discussions were taking place in Africa as well. And we decided to show an efforts with Charlotte and, this, and design this um, project in which the idea is to take a bird eye view, bird eye perspective on the discussion of, of term limits reforms um, with, with big questions. So you, you will see, I'm not gonna give a lot of details on, on this uh, processes, but I will uh, give you an overview and the big questions that concern us uh, are related to institutionalization issues, how if these rules have been institutionalized, to what extent, and what's the relationship between uh, term limits change and democracies and uh, pro processes of democratization and, and autocratization. I have divided the presentation in three parts. The first part, um, I introduce you to the study of presidential term limits. I provide you with a definition and the meaning of term limit change and why it's important what we learn of studying this topic in the, these two regions. In the second part, I get a little, a little bit more technical and explain you the empirical strategy we used to study presidential term limit changes. And in the third part, I give you my thoughts, uh, the conclusions of what we have learned so far until the moment. So let's turn to the definition of presidential term limits. So there is a lot of uh, constitutional history uh, or theory behind the idea of term limits. Uh, to understand what they mean, we first need to distinguish term limits from terms in office. In representative democracies, all elected officials serve for a period of time in office, which is defined in the constitution. However, some constitutions also establish a term limit, so a restriction on the number of terms in office that the head of the state may serve. In other words, a fixed term in office is a typical feature of every democracy, but term limits may be present or not. For reasons that I can explain in the discussion, if you are interested, term limits are typical of presidential constitutions as the US constitution, that is constitutions establishing that presidents are directly elected. In the United States, Presidents may serve until two consecutive terms, and they normally do because it's rare that they lose this re-election, but you know, we have seen this a few months ago, it can happen that they fail. And even though uh, the United States is the most famous presidential system in the world, they are not the inventors of the term limits. The two term limits were an informal rule in that country for a long time until a constitutional amendment brought them into the constitution in 1951, once uh, President uh, Theodore Roosevelt was seeking a third and won a third term in office, thus breaking an informal rule that had prevailed since George Washington stating that presidents should step down after a second term. So the US example 
uh, help us to understand what are term limits for and why should we have term limits in a, in a constitution. The most important reason is that they aim to constrain powerful executives, avoid the personalization of power and the incumbent's advantage. This would help to put checks on the head of the state and thus protect democracy with more alternation in power and political competition. Of course, some people do not like term limits that much as every institution, they have disadvantages. Typically, um, for example, limiting the executive, by limiting the executive's uh, time in office, we may hinder expertise accumulation and electoral accountability. But the recent history, it has taught us that term limits are very valued across the world. But where do term limits come from? For that answer, we have to move to Latin America. Latin America is the continent of pure presidentialism, as you may know, where term limits were introduced already in the 19th century. And this rule remained belonging to this region only for a long time in history. It was only until the middle of the 20th century, and especially with the democratization processes that took place in the 80s and in the 90s, that this rule spread all over the world. The spread of this rule coincided with the adoption of presidential and semi-presidential constitutions in many of the countries that transitioned to democracy, um, for instance, in Sub-Saharan Africa, but also in Eastern Europe, as you may know. And this is the map uh, you can see here of term limits in this two regions that, uh, with which I'm concerned in the year 2019. It is important, I think, with the colors, you can see with the different types of greens, that the, there are variations in, in how the rule looks like. So when we talk about term limits, we are not talking about the same thing all the time. We see, for example, that the US model of two consecutive terms all does not prevail everywhere. There are more or less constraining rules as depicted in the different grades of green. So uh, importantly, today, most of the countries have some form of term limit. But this has been a moving target. Uh, as we will see now, these term limits have been debated and have been reformed a lot since uh, redemocratization. So it is uh, interesting uh, for us, and pro but probably not so surprising that presidents, once the rule was installed or reinstated in the countries, presidents reacted against the rule in the two regions in parallel. In both regions, they began like an amendment fever um, that took place soon after the uh, adoption or the resumption of, of the rule. In many cases, these changes were very dramatic. So in the, best of, in, the, in the best of the worlds, there was a constitutional amendment in a peaceful legislative discussion, and we have had many of those. But very often, presidents have sought to circumvent legislative discussion. They have twisted the reform rules, and they have used other methods to get what they wanted, which is their immediate reelection. And thus, they end up polarizing society. So people could get very angry. They could go to the street, demonstrate, etc. And um, these are the typical cases that come to the to the front front of the news. And you have heard probably of many of those. So there are many of those controversial situations in the two regions that I'm studying. We have to remember that Latin America is the continent not only of term limits, but also famous for being the land of the caudillos and the continuismo, as Javier would have put it, of the stayovers. And then in Africa, term limits were also meant to constrain the big man rulers, as they call it them. So we can imagine that from the very beginning, there was going to be a tension between the rule, the term limit rule, and the powerful rulers. 
and that the rule would not always win in this competition. So the literature acknowledged this kind of tension, this, this reform fever, and a huge academic production began to take place. But curiously, the works that were taking place on these two regions wouldn't connect much uh, each other. Uh, so in general, the academic literature is overtly dominated by positive views on rule stability. The literatures on democratization and institutionalization consider that rule stability is basic for both democracy and institutionalization and that they reinforce each other. If we want to consolidate young democracies, we need that the institutions remain stable. So, so goes the argument. And this is the only way to give horizon and predictability to the actors and to keep powerful executives under constraint. Of course, institutions need to adapt, but adaption is a mild version of change and this would be acceptable. So the literature on term limits has not seen much adaptions, mostly has marked profound turnarounds with negative impacts for democratization and institutionalization. So we identify some paths that you can see there in this slide. The continuismo path that removes the rule and, and ends up in autocratizing the regime. The instability path that changes the rule of all the time and, to, in, and later to a lesser extent the efficiency path that adapts the rule to the needs of the new times. Of course, this path come from real examples. Here you can see um, two typical situations that have occurred in the two regions, but have been named differently. So in Latin America, until the 90s, no constitution included the possibility of a consecutive re-election of the president, as was the case in the United States. But this began to change in the 1990s. And the first cases were Peru under President Fujimori, and the one you are seeing there, which is the case on Argentina, the constitutional reform that took place under President Carlos Menem, who passed away a few days ago. And, um, and this reform in Argentina did not cancel the term limits, but relaxed them, allowing the immediate re-election. The re-election debate after these cases began to see, be seen much more and questioned in the, in the literature and the case of Peru, it led to autocratization. In the case of Argentina, it didn't, but it was very controversial in any case. And then I put you there the a similar case, not the same, but, but, um, but quite typical of the third term bid in Africa, the case of Cameroon, where the two term rules were introduced in 96 um, and removed in 2008 to allow the president Paul Vigna, who had been president since the 80s to continue ruling. So now I see you other cases, um, different kinds of reforms uh, passed that have taken place in the two regions. So usually the literature treats term limits reforms as isolated events. So we, we, we learn on the diff different um, reforms uh, happening in this country and the other countries, but we don't connect them as a change um, or as a sequence in the argument. And so we normally disregard the path or the thread that consecutive reforms draw across at the time. The only literature that has referred to reforms as part of a broader or longitudinal process are case studies and the works like the ones by Brinks um, et al. talking on weak institutionalization in Latin America, for example. I show you there the cases of Burkina Faso and Bolivia showing term limits reform occurring one after the other along the time. And, and these cases have been very much, very often referred to as cases of weak institutionalization because this, the rule could not 
stay for a longer time and develop the effects on the political actors because it has been subject permanently to, to reform. Then um, you have there the case in Burkina Faso, uh, for instance, where the president, uh, Blaise Compare, abolished the term li limit rule first, but was forced to introduce it later in the year 2000 to appease heavy protest against the murder of a journalist. And then in 2005, the same president managed that the Supreme Court reinterpreted the term limit rule uh, to rule again. But in 2014, when he attempted to reform the rule again, there were popular protests and um, he was ousted uh, from power. So uh, I'm telling this because this looks very familiar for to those is, uh, working on Latin America as well. If you see uh, down there the case uh, of Bolivia and the president Evo Morales, a charismatic leader of the movement to socialism. His constitutional reform approved two consecutive terms, but he governed three terms thanks to a circumvention with the help also of the Constitutional Court. Then he brought, he thought uh, to reform the constitution, to obtain a forced mandate and ask the people in a referendum. He lost the referendum. Then he asked again the constitutional court and the court said yes in a controversial ruling that changed the constitution. Then he was, he could run again in 2019 and we know the end of the story is more recent. So in short, we have had this ongoing phenomena in the two regions that look not that different but we still we have not studied and framed them together. So we felt that if we compare more systematically, we could better understand the, the, the range of processes going on around the reforms in the two regions and that's so contribute to the literature on democratization and institutionalization. So how do we do this? Uh, so we collected new original uh, data on term limit reform attempts in Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa. All the attempts that had um, occurred had been then uh, successful or not. And um, to give you an idea, these regions include uh, 58 presidential or semi-presidential regimes, which uh, total 55% of the world of uh, of presidential regimes in the world, 19 located in Latin America, 39 in Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, we see that despite differences in rule longevity and other important differences such as past experience with democracy and economic development, of course, the two regions have equally experienced a large number of attempts to change the rule. So we consulted 30 to 40 years of, of regional reports and came out with 117 uh, term limit attempts, 46 of them or about 40% of them in Latin America and 71, uh, about 60% located um, in, in Africa. Uh, but it's quite amazing the, the, the number of reforms that we have had per country, like a country average of two reforms and a yearly average of also um, two reforms and, and a, a low number of disapproved reforms, about 20% were not approved. Um, but still 85% of uh, the countries have today some form of term limits despite all that uh, movement. So to grasp a high number of reforms uh, spreading across time in these durations and to be able to find patterns among those paths or reforms, we train ourselves in a, in a technique that is called sequence analysis. It's a technique that comes from computer science and, and genetic and helps to analyze and discover patterns in sequential, sequential data. There is not much seen in, in political science, but it's a traditional method in sociology, especially in life sociology. And so we focus on two specific aspects of the term limit reforms, the direction, if they were like extending or, 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 or limiting the presidential term in office and the outcome, if they were, if the changes were passed or, or not. With this information, we transform each country in a sequence, uh, 
comprising a succession of different steps or moves, which represent the different reform attempts. And I, sh I tried to show you there how the four cases I, I was talking uh, about before can now be translated into the, into the language of sequence analysis. And, um, and we can see that, that despite the variety and almost idiosyncratic character that each country has uh, in each path of reform, some paths repeat and we can find some kind of uh, patterns and, and some uh, repeats, uh, some things repeat sometimes frequently. So a little, uh, very quickly on the colors, if you see this dark green, it means that this uh, reform attempt was going to extend the time of, of, of the president in power. If you see the, 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 the light green, it was going to reduce the, the, the time of, of, the, of the president in power. If you see the orange, it was a failed attempt and you will see another color later which are those cases that did not uh, remove um, did not move at all so what we did was uh, now we we built um, 58 uh, sequences with 58 countries and and to compare then we we play a, a lot around uh, with this um, a sequence we obtained and, and produced some clusters and, and, and we tried many things and, and the results were quite stable. We obtained those so six clusters that can be distinguished because of the length of the sequences, because of the direction of the reforms and because of the, of the uh, outcomes. We, we gave them names, for instance, the first one are the relaxers, the second one are the rule keepers, the third one, the losers, the, then the tower of war, restrainers, and the stable rulers. So now I'm going to give you the, um, uh, the three main results I think are, are worth uh, mentioning for, for our discussion later. Um, the first one is that we have an uneven distribution of, of term limit reform attempts across the countries. So what, what we learn first is that most reform attempts occur where um, reforms have previously already happened. So we have this, uh, for instance, three small uh, clusters, uh, smaller clusters that comprise nine, seven, and four sequences or, K or countries each. So only 30% of the countries have together um, made the most uh, reform attempts of the whole sample. So the majority of, of, of term limit reform attempts, 64% have occurred in this, um, only in these countries. Uh, so which makes us, can us, uh, lead us to think that this instability, uh, so they, they could be the typical cases when we talk about weak institutionalization of the rule. However, the interesting thing with the cluster uh, experiment <laughs> is that uh, we, we cannot talk about just weak institutionalization in general because they are quite different uh, among them. So we have the, uh, at the bottom, uh, on the left, we have the restrainers, which are um, uh, countries where the, loop was, the rule was changed over time, but uh, countries where the, the, the strong executives gave impulse and mostly managed to relax the rule, but they were not strong enough as to impede a last movement in the counter direction. So in the end, the rule was restrained again. This is very different from the other cluster that you see in the middle on the right, which is the tag of war. We call it the tag of, of war because uh, here you see countries that have had many reforms between four and five reforms, one after the other, in which the last move may have been either a restraint or a relaxing of, of the presidential term. 
And, and, and when it comes to these sequences, we can judge that the presidents have been more successful in getting their way than in the previous cluster. Although these results may not be very durable, we could say. And then we have the cluster three in the losers, where presidents have tried to change the term limit rule, but repeatedly failed. Those in these cases, the rule remained stable, but it's uncertain whether the rule will also prove resistant in the future. One of those cases is Paraguay. Javier will know about that. Um, then I move now to my second. Um, so kind of result, uh, what did we learn about continuismo? So um, continuismo may mean several things. So according to the region where you are, so when in the literature we talk about continuismo, we may have different ideas uh, in our heads. So the, uh, at least we could see that there is an African path, which are the relaxers over there on the left, uh, upper left. And then the, the Tau of War Pass, which is more the Latin American way. Uh, in the end, both paths may lead to a removal of the term liver rule, but they are different. So the, 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 the relaxers move, um, involve just one move, one, one by which the power holders relax or circumvent the rule and remain unconstrained by it. So it's a deinstitutionalization a process that brings the country into an authoritarian uh, path. The tug of war is a bit, little bit different. It's a gradual and progressive relaxation of the rule in a change of reforms, continuing until its final lifting. It is unleashed in countries which started with a higher level of democracy in comparison to the first authoritarian past. So in, the, in this type of war cases, autocratization meets some social resistance and is not a straightforward development. It may happen in the end, but it's not straightforward. In fact, our data shows that while autocratization is a possible end, it is not inevitable, as many countries with term rule instability did not evolve in an authoritarian way. And I come now to my third conclusion. Our results is what about stability? Is stability a good thing? Rule is stability a good thing as the literature portrays it? So we have here two clusters that resemble a little bit the stability path. So we learned that uh, stability of term limit rules is more prevalent. That's, that's a very interesting thing that we, when we think about term limits, um, we think they are changed all the time, but 50% of the cases we studied did not change the rule at all, uh, as the common um, wisdom suggests. So we, it, these two clusters uh, show relatively stable term limits um, comprising a, a lot of countries. And, but the study of the African cases um, so lead us to some uh, cautiousness about the good uh, rule is stability. So we learn uh, there in the upper right um, corner that um, instability is, stability is not, not necessarily a good thing. It can also mask ineffectiveness of institutions. Um, so it's only in the cluster uh, stable rule on the, in the bottom that the highest level of democracies correspond to the stability uh, in the rule. So, um, uh, and the other one there were like, uh, was like, a, so in, in, the, in the upper corner, it's like a bad cluster. Most of them are um, cases with, with uh, ineffective term limits presidents who still have not passed the test of compliance because they have not reached the end of the term, but we, have, we are suspicious that they won't, um, they won't uh, uh, comply with the rule in the end. So for, 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 for democracies, we, can, um, we have to look at the stability cluster uh, stable rule down there, um, but there are not so many cases uh, as you can see. 
uh, for democracies, we also have uh, to include some instability uh, clusters as well. Uh, somehow, uh, um, it was a kind of surprising for us to see uh, that reforms um, uh, that that reforms that that the countries that were reforming a lot as well were also um, maintaining certain levels of democracy. Also, uh, if we think that to re reform the rule uh, several times, you need certain levels of constant of contestation in the society. Um, we could understand that we need. Um, a certain uh, level of, of yes of of, um, of freedom in the in, in 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 the political system the society for these many movements uh, to take uh, place. So um, sorry, I'm, Mariana, just a, a reminder of time. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I'm going to go to my 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 um, last slide. So I lose. I, we can discuss the other things uh, later. Um, so um, now I I move then to quickly to to the three questions that were important for us uh, by studying these uh, quite uh, kind of similar uh, movements in two regions. What, what did we find about the relation between term limits and democracy? Um, well, we we find that. Uh, Presidential democracies have first have always term limits, uh, but autocracies do have term limits as well, but not always. So the, the tendency is that they 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 don't have um, they will lose they will have term limits written in the constitutions, but they will not survive. Uh, probably they will try to change them sooner or later. Uh, what did we uh, learn about uh, rule stability? That's interesting. We find a high number of reform attempts. Um, we, we, we found that a high number of reform attempts does not always lead to autocratization. Uh, this is actually a good signal in consolidating democracies uh, that the president is being confronted by other political forces. Although, uh, if we have a lot of instability, uh, these democracies will uh, not uh, reach a high quality. And the last, very last point: what kind of institutionalization we find? Um, if we found it very difficult to talk about weak or strong, as normally happens. Um, here in the in the literature, we have fewer strong cases, but we have several kinds of several degrees of weak institutionalization, and we find that this is a, a subject that requires much further research. Thank you a lot for your attention. I'm sorry if I exceeded my time. <laughs>